peace, chosen vessel and chosen vessel everywhere. Welcome to another Tuesday Night Live Bible class. We are so grateful to be with each and every one of you tonight as we take some time to share in the marvelous word of God. It's been a great day. I hope you all have had a chance to enjoy yourself. If you're here in Texas, we've had some cooler weather, so we are so grateful for that. And we're praying that each of you, wherever you are, will be blessed tonight as we speak to you from the word of our Lord. But before we go to the word, because it's not time for the word just yet, you know what time it is. You really don't, don't play with us. You know what time it is. It's seed time at the Chosen Vessel. And we have four ways to give for those that are watching over all of our cyber networks. You can give by Givelify uh, to the Chosen Vessel Cathedral, or you can give by Cash App at dollar sign TCVC Ministries. You can also give by PayPal at paypal.me forward slash TCVC 4650. Or you can give by text to give to 833-948-1987. So please, whatever you do, wherever you are, let's sow a seed tonight. And as we always ask on Tuesday night, we're asking at least 400 of you to please give a $20 seed. Now, if, if Bishop Sapp was here tonight, he would tell you that he would say, I used to think $20 was a lot of money. And of course, we know that nowadays $20 doesn't go very far, but we need your financial contributions to help us continue to expand this ministry and to do the wonderful things and the wonderful works that we are doing before the Lord. Will you do that with me? Thank you very much. Let's pray tonight before we go into the word. Gracious Father, we just want to thank you today in all of your majesty, in all of your grace, and in all of your mercy. We glorify your holy and righteous name, and we thank you for this time that we are able to gather around your word, that we may learn and hear, that you may give us grace and power, that you may build up our spiritual man unto good works. We just want to thank you and praise you. Now bless every ear that has an ear to hear what thus saith the word of our Lord. Well, tonight, if you would turn in your, on your smart devices, or even if you happen to have a physical copy of the Word of God with you, turn tonight to the book of Titus, chapter number two, and we're going to be reading tonight and teaching tonight from verses 11 through 14, and I'm going to be reading tonight from the New International Version. Paul is writing, and he says this, for... The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Listen to this. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. I want to take a few moments tonight to teach from this theme the lessons of grace. Write that down. Somebody put that in the chat tonight. The lessons of grace. What can we learn about grace? God's infinite grace is the theme of this text, as well as in all of Scripture. Grace, whether expressly or implicitly stated, is the means by which God personally delivers all of his blessings and all of his benefits, especially to those of us who believe. Ephesians 2 and 8 and 9 says this. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. 
Grace is the means by which the salvation, the blessings, and all the benefits of God are delivered to people. Theologians have defined grace historically as unmerited favor. That's a fancy way of saying God gives to us what we don't deserve without us having to do anything in order to deserve it. And what that simply means is that all the blessings that God bestows upon us, the very breath that you breathe, the, the, the very life that you live, the ability to be able to wake up in the morning and go about your day all come as a result of God's grace, especially when it comes to the establishment and the continuation of our relationship of salvation, the redemption from our sins and the indwelling gift of the Holy Ghost. The most precious commodity in all of this work, in all of this earth that we receive by faith is given to us not by us trying our hardest or our best to, to, to grit our teeth, to bear down and to make sure that we are living lives pleasing of God. As much as that counts, and we'll talk about that in a minute, it is by his grace that he delivers us, that he connects to us, that he establishes his love, his relationship, his blessings, and all of his kindness in our lives. We could not earn it even if we tried. There is not enough money in all of this earth for us to be able to earn the love of God in Christ Jesus. We think, well, I, 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 I got to live right. I got to do right. Yes, you do, but not for the reasons why you think. It's not in order to receive something from God. Rather, it's because you have received something from God. Your blessings and your grace don't come because you are trying so hard to have more good on one side of that mythological scale of life and hoping that when you stand before the pearly gates, they'll be able to weigh the good and the bad. And if you have more good on this side, you go to heaven. And if you have more bad on this side, then you go to hell. The, 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 the truth of the matter is, if, you have, if, if, if that was the means by which our relationship is established and purified, if there were any items on the other side of the scale, it would disqualify us from heaven. Because the scriptures tell us that no sin is able to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So it's not a question of who's trying to do better than the others. Anyone, all of us are born dead in trespass and sin. None of us are worthy of and are earned and are earned the right to enter into God's kingdom. But oh, by his grace, yes, by his mercy, which we have nothing to contribute to, but he gives it to us, as we said in Ephesians, by his grace through faith, and even the faith is given to us. It is God's gift so that you can't brag. You can't stick your chest out and say, look at how good I have been <laughs> to the Lord in, in receiving his grace. So grace is our unmerited favor. And tonight, in the text that we've read tonight, uh, Paul is writing to Titus. And in the setting of this text, Paul has a, a church was established in the city of Crete, and Paul appointed Titus to go to that city and to be the organizer of the church, to set things in place that were lacking, to ordain uh, elders and bishops and deacons in the church, and to make sure that the church had proper order as it, was, as it in its infancy was beginning to establish itself as a force to be reckoned with. And so he begins in this passage by talking to us about the common grace that we all receive. Now, it's always been a, a common belief for many people to think 
because grace is given to us as something that is freely given without us having to try to strive and do our best to earn it in and of ourselves, that that means that simply we don't do anything to receive it at all, that we don't do anything at all, rather, to contribute to it, that it just gives us the right to receive God's blessings and God's grace and live any way we choose to live. That's the way some people falsely teach that because it's by grace, it doesn't matter what we do after we receive God's grace. We can act and behave in any way we choose and still know that we're going to end up in God's heaven. But we must understand what grace actually is. Notice in our text tonight, it it it, it, it identifies grace as a school. You say, where, where do you see, Pastor Hatcher, that, that grace is a school? It's right there in the text. It's, it's right there. Look in your Bible. Look in your Bible. Look on your phone. Look on your, on your tablet. Look on your screen. It says this. It says this. For the grace of God that offers salvation to all people, it, no, notice this, it teaches us. Did you catch that? Grace is a teacher. Grace isn't just a free pass to heaven. It's not a hall pass that allows you to get out of the classroom and doing the work of the class and get out and just roam the halls doing whatever you wish. No, grace is a professor. It is a master teacher. It is a, an instructor and a developer of personal character and of personal fortitude, strength and, and personal lives that we develop to the glory of God. Grace is the school of life, and all of us must learn from that school. When we think of school, there's there, there several kinds of school. There's the, the kind of school that you learn subjects, many subjects that you have to have in order to graduate from a particular educational facility. And, and, and some classes, as many of us have, we take uh, because it's in the curriculum and we don't necessarily feel as if we need that class. But grace is not that kind of class. Grace is more like, if I could think about it this way, a trade school where we are taught that what we, for which we need in order to function in the job or the responsibility or the calling for which God has called you. You are in God's trade school of life, and everything that he communicates to you by his grace through his word is beneficial to you in order for you to live in this world as the people of God being ambassadors of Christ to make an impact in the lives of others as well as develop in your everyday life. Now notice, he says that grace teaches us. And so what we want to do tonight is identify several things that grace teaches us. First thing is, it teaches us to say no. Did you catch that? Somebody put that in the chat tonight. Grace teaches me how to say no. And no, to say no, is a lesson that many of us need to learn and embrace. Grace teaches us how to say no. Say no to what? It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Oh, look at what it does for us. That's how our holiness, our righteousness, our positive and good and developed character comes because great, the grace of God which he gives to us is the teacher that instructs us and trains us how to live a life of holiness, righteousness, and of good sound character. And the way he does that is by teaching us to say no, recognizing that through the grace of God, we now have a choice. We have a freedom that we didn't have before we came to the Lord. Yes, before you came to him, you were, you were, you were dead to trespass and sin. You didn't have any choice. It was in your 
your physical DNA. It was in your physical nature to do whatever you felt that you were big and bad enough and equipped and desired and wanted to do. And we all indulged in greater degrees to what we desired to do in our own lives. And because of that, because that the old man that we used to be was, was bound by sin, it was dead in sin, it was dead in trespass and sin, as the word says, we really didn't have a choice. So we, we felt like we had a choice because we picked some things that we liked and we rejected some things that we didn't like. But oh, the, the, the devil always knew what our weak point was. And ultimately, sin always and wrongdoing always had held us captive to our fleshly lusts. And that was the goal of our life. And that's the goal of many of our lives, to try to indulge ourselves into things that that please us, that pleasure us, that make us feel good, that make us feel better about ourselves. But Paul says to us that this grace that he gives to us teaches us to say no. In other words, it tells us that those of us that have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We are therefore buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the glory of God, it says in Romans 6, even so we should now walk in newness of life. For he that has died is, did you hear that? Is, not could be, not desires to be, but he that has died in Christ through baptism is free from sin. Oh, praise God, past the biscuits, you have been freed from that which has bound us and condemned us. You have been made free, and because of that, you now have a choice to be able to say no, to resist. That's why the scriptures tell us to resist the devil, and he shall flee. It tells us to resist because we have the option now. We have the power, rather, that's a better term. We've got the power, we've got the authority to say, no, I'm not giving in to the way that I used to live. No, I'm not doing those things that displease God. And better yet, no, I am not indulging that into that which is no longer a part of who I am. That's the power. That's what we learn by grace. That is what we need in order to release ourselves. And one of the things that, that causes many children of God to still be subject to the temptations of their flesh is they have not realized this great truth that because of his grace and his mercy in the power of our spirit, we, may, we have been made alive in him and we are no longer subject to our prior nature. So grace teaches us to say no. But notice what it tells us to say no to, ungodliness and worldly passions. Now, grace also teaches us, part of the curriculum of the sil syllabus of grace, it also teaches us how to live. Look at the second part, the, sec the B clause of verse 12. It says, and to live, it first told us to say no, but then it says, but and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. He tells us that because of what we are learning in the, in, in the institution of grace, we ought to, our lives should be characterized as being, first of all, self-controlled. It's a word that simply means we should be disciplined, being able to be rig regimented in our behavior and, and have a process of our lives that, that, that we are in self-control of our actions, our beliefs, our emotions. Oh, we know how it is. Some of us think, and, and sometimes it really is the case, that, that we just fly off at the handle and, and say whatever we desire to say whenever the, 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 the emotion or the event or the situation or that person <laughs> gets on our last nerve 
And we just, we just, we just, we just, and we were like, I just, I just, I just got to tell them, I just got to tell them off. If you're a child of God, no, you don't. Oh, there's a right way in order to correct and put anybody who's going crazy in place. But we have to do it in a self-controlled manner. Remember, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. So it tells us how to be self-controlled, to be disciplined. The second thing it tells us, it teaches us, is how to live upright. That means we are that 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 right living, that right standing, that that upright moral individual that that chooses to to live on the higher plane that chooses not to not to go low when when they go low but as 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 as, as was said in the, by Michelle Obama that when they go low we go we get higher we we don't bow down to the ways of the society around us. We don't stoop down to the level of those who are not redeemed by the blood of Christ. We don't go there when they go there just because they go there. But no, we stay in the discipline of the teaching and the education we get from this school of grace and learn how to live upright lives. Secondly, he, he gets real specific and he says, it also tells us how to live godly lives in this present age. He emphasizes the word godly, even though he said enough already to help us understand the kind of lives that we're, going, that we're supposed to live. Why does he use the term godly? He's already said self-controlled and upright lives, but no, he says godly because he wants to make sure that we understand the nature and the character of the upright lives that we ought to live. Understand this, there are quote unquote, good people all over the world. Good people who aren't, who aren't followers of Christ. Good people who are not as we would classify them, saved. We know there are people who don't go, and you know them, you know there, there's, a, there's that handful of people that you know who, who, who don't go to anybody's church, yet they're the nicest, they're the most polite, they're the most, in some cases, the wonderful people in the world. In, in, in many cases, we, we know people who don't, don't, who don't cross the door of anybody's church and yet there's some of the sweetest, nicest, and well-behaved people that we can know. But the reason why he says godly lives is because he wants us to distinguish from the character of the physical man and that of the spiritual man. Remember, there was a story of the, of the, of the time that Jesus was approached by the rich young ruler. We remember him the young man who was wealthy and healthy and wise and the prime of his life and he was he had it all together he he had his career he had his money uh, he 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 was rolling and going and and he came to Jesus and said good master what good thing must i do in order to get into heaven and Jesus said well you know what to do keep all the commandments and what did the rich young man say to him he says and Jesus said, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you will love your neighbor as yourself. He, gave, he summed up the law. And the rich young man said, all this have I done from my youth. Ha. Huh. All this have I done from my youth. All this, he said, have I done from my youth. In other words, he says, Everything that God requires of me, I have done from the time from, from I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a cradle to grave child of God. I've, I've, lived per, I've lived by the standards of God all my life. But there was a problem. He came to Jesus and he said, what good thing must I do? If he was so confident in who he was, if he was so confident in his keeping of the commands and the laws of God, why did he then need to feel the, the compulsion to come to the Lord and say, what other good thing must I do? The Lord 
seizing on this opportunity and recognizing that this man was a, a, a man full of his own self. He was, he was smelling his own he was smelling his own self and believing that he was somebody much more than he thought that he ought to be. Jesus put him to the test. Oh, okay, you say that you've done all of this, you, you've loved your neighbor as yourself, like you say you have? Well, do this, and this is the, you asked me the one thing, let me give you the one thing. I want you to sell everything you have. Give it all to the poor, because you love your neighbor as yourself. You've kept this all your life, so why do you still have all this money? If you love your neighbor as you love yourself, and you love yourself enough that you've been banking and rolling and going, then, then spread the wealth around. Sell everything you have. Give it all to the poor. Put yourself in their shoes, and then, 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 when you've done all of that, when you've done everything that you've said you've done throughout your life from the time that you were a baby up until now, then come and follow me. He didn't jump at that offer. No, the word says he walked away sad. And I believe the scripture implies he walked away never to come back because he loved what he had more than he loved God, which means that he didn't even keep the first command to love the Lord our God with all our heart soul, mind, and strength. Well, you're not saying, Pastor, tonight that I've got to give everything I have to, to the poor and, and come follow God. That wasn't the point of his message. His, 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 his statement was to break down the self-righteous, the, 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 the natural, good, self-deceived belief that he was a good person just because of who he was. He wants us in this present life to live godly lives. We must live for God on purpose. We must live for God with an intent. We must live for God boldly. We must, as, as they say in, in the Star Trek, boldly go where no man has ever gone before by living a life that is living out loud our faith to others. No, not doing so in the sense of look at me, who I am, how spiritual I am, but no, we need to live a life that is God, that is decidedly not just good, but God in our character. We're not just trying to be good people because there's a lot of good people out there that we're trying to be godly people. Those that there's just something more different about them and that is they're not simply being good people, they're being godly people. People who have been transformed by the love of God the grace of God in Christ Jesus. So then, we are to live godly lives in this present age. Right now, in this life, not, well, not wait till you get to heaven, no. Grace teaches us how to live in the right here and right here now. Right now, where you are right now, in it, the job that you work at now, and with the people that you hang out with now, the home that you live in now, those that you go to church with now, those that you hang out with when you're not at church now, in this present world now, not at some time in the future, but in this present age. Don't put it off until, well, I need to wait until I get some things. I need to, I need to sow my wild oats. No, in this present age, in the here and now, in the, and here's what he's actually saying. He wants us to live our lives, our self-control, our upright right and our godly lives in the face of the world around us that's what he means by in this present world we are to live in this world that is full of death trespass sin evil backbiting and all manner of of, of, of ill will towards others in this world full of spite and hate in which everybody's being canceled left and right in this present world that is full of anger and malice and all manner of of false be of, 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 of bad behavior that in this present world we are to 
live in such a way that we are living in this present age as a contrast. Is your life in contrast to the world around you? Is it a self-controlled, upright, and godly contrast to what's going on in the behavior around you. Don't let yourself get caught up in the emotions and the character of this present age in which we are always looking to one-up somebody, to find fault in somebody, to pick out, nitpick somebody else and, and always try to tear them down and to, and to, and to get over. And up. No, no, let us live godly, self-controlled, and upright lives in this present age. Number three, God's grace, the school of grace teaches us to wait. Yeah, <laughs> that's the word we don't like. It teaches us to wait. Look at verse 13. We do all of this while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word wait here is from the Greek word prestophomai, which means not just to wait in terms of I'm just sitting here waiting around, just chilling, looking for something to happen, waiting for something to break off, waiting for something to come about. No, we are waiting with an expectancy. We're, t we're waiting with something to look forward to. The meaning of, of prostephomai means to wait in an anticipatory state. We're waiting while we're looking. We're waiting as we're, wait as we're looking for and expecting something to happen at any moment and at, at any time. We're living an urgent life. We're, we're, as, as Paul says, we're redeeming the time because the days of evil. That word redeeming, which is in the old King James, means to make the most of our time. Why are we making the most of our time? Why are we counting the time, redeeming the time? Because the days are evil. Because we are waiting for the blessed hope. There's, there's something that we're looking forward to. There's something that we are living our lives for. There's something which is the ultimate goal of our lives. See, you thought you were living to get a larger house. You thought you were living for a better car. You thought you were living for just that perfect marriage. You thought you were living for comfort and ease. You thought you were living for the day of retirement. No, he says, we are looking forward to the great, the coming of our great, God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the hope. That is the blessed hope. That is the expectant end to our lives that we are looking forward to. There is something that is our goal. There is something that is our desire. There is something that we are expecting and we're looking forward each and every day. No, we know we don't know the times. We're not trying to count the days and number the days and know when the end of time is coming. No, but we are expecting that at any moment, do you recognize that the character of the of the early church was that they expected the Lord to come back in their lifetime and every generation of Christians for 2,000 years has been living at a time that they looked at some of the things happening around them and said this is the time why is it that there has always been something because we, we see it now when COVID came out or when wars break out. We say, oh, there's the war when the Ukraine broke out. Uh-oh, there it is. Wars and rumors of wars. Uh-oh, there's sickness and pestilence. In every age, there has always been something that made us think that when, when, when back those of us that were young enough to, old enough to remember, when the year 2000 came in and there was Y2K, when we thought that the computers that weren't thinking about the year 2000 were going to flip over and everything was going to go crazy. People were thinking this is the time now and why is it that there is always something in every single age of Christianity that makes one believe that the Lord is coming in their lifetime because we are waiting 
We are waiting in expectation for the appearing. That's what we're looking for. We're anticipating it. That's why we always find things to think, make us think that this is the moment because it is that which we should desire above everything else. It is our motivation. We aren't doing what we do or, 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 or repenting of sin and living righteous lives because that's just the way we want to live. No, we're doing all of this. Don't we know that every one of us could live as crazy and as wild as we want to live? But we live the, this self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. We're being taught that because we're looking for the coming of our Lord, which is something far better. And finally, it teaches us to piggyback off that. It teaches us in verse 14 to be eager. Verse 14 says, he who gave himself, the coming of our Lord, Je Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and purify for himself a people that are his very own. And here it is, eager to do what is good. This life that we live, this life of self-controlled, upright, godly expectancy is not something that we do because we are forced to because we have to, because we are going against our own desires. No, because it's just what God tells us to do. He, he makes, it's not because he makes these commands and, oh, it ain't what I want to do, but it's what I got to do. Because he, no, we're doing so because we're eager to do what is good. That is our hope. That is our desire. That is what we get from, we learn from this school of grace. There may be someone out there tonight and you say, Pastor, I want that kind of life that you've just talked about. I want that, that transformation in my life that, that allows me, that helps me, that teaches me to live upright, godly, uh, self-controlled life that is expectant and that is, that is eager to do what's right. I haven't found it in myself to be able to do that, and I want that kind of relationship. The Bible says it's right there. The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. The Bible says tonight that if you are not yet born again, if you have not been, if you have not been baptized in water and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You don't have to wait for a church service right there, right now where you are. It's right there in, if the word is in your mouth. The Bible says, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. If tonight the Lord has moved you to do that, why don't you just repeat this after me? Lord Jesus, I recognize now that I am a sinner. I admit that I am a sinner. I am in need of a savior. And I've been convicted that you died for me to help me to live a transformed, upright, upright self-controlled, and godly life. And I now acknowledge you with my mouth as my Lord and my savior. I believe that you were raised triumphantly from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have done that tonight, I just want you to text the word CHOSEN to the number that appears on your screen, 817-442-6775. If that is your confession tonight of Jesus as your Lord, text CHOSEN to 817-442-6775. When you do that, we will respond to you with information that will help you grow and establish your faith that you may grow now and learn in this school of life to live in this self-controlled, upright, and godly life that we are given.
Now, some of you may say, well, I'm already saved. I'm already born again. I've already confessed him with my mouth and I believe in my heart. But I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a, a, a new church home, one that, 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 that demonstrates that grace where I can learn from the school of grace. And I believe that the chosen vessel, that chosen vessel is the place. I want to sit under the feet of the teaching of Bishop Marvin Sapp and, and, and share in the fellowship of this beloved, wonderful, great family of faith hope. Well, you don't have to wait until Sunday. No, you don't have to wait until you come back into the sanctuary. You can join us right now. All you have to do is pick up your cell phone again and then text the word VESSEL, V-E-S-S-E-L, to 817-442-6775. You don't have to walk an aisle. You don't have to come down in front of everybody. Just, just pick up your phone and text VESSEL to 817-442-6775. And by doing that, we will place you as a member of Chosen Vessel. We'll reach out to you to help you grow in your grace. Well, family, we are so grateful for all of you who have watched tonight, and we pray that God's word has been a blessing in your life. And so now as we close, as we always say, don't forget to come out for those of us who worship with us on Sunday morning for our 11 a.m. worship experience. We look forward to seeing you there. And as always, may the grace and the peace of God be with each and every one of you.